Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Russia's First Revolutionaries, The Decemberists, by Epic History TV. So, this is a little different than the kind of videos we usually react to, but after watching Epic History TV's Napoleonic War series, I've become quite a fan of their channel. Uh, they did a fantastic job on that series, and I'm excited to see other videos that they've made. Uh, and in addition, I, I know a bit about the Decemberists, uh, and I know that they are definitely connected to the Napoleonic Wars. So there, there's a bit of a connection there. Um, so I'm excited to get into this one. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's get into this reaction. 1815. At the Battle of Waterloo, French Emperor Napoleon... Oh, there you go, starting with Waterloo. ...Bonaparte suffers his final defeat, and two decades of war in Europe come to an end. The victorious powers, led by Austria, Britain, Prussia, and Russia, meet at Vienna to decide the fate of Europe. The frontiers of nations and empires are redrawn, while Emperor Alexander of Russia adds King of Poland to his list of titles. Yeah, and given how influential the Napoleonic Wars ended up being on the history of the world, and in particular the history of Europe, it's unsurprising that we'd start off right here, given that uh, uh, this whole situation with the Decemberists happens in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. Basically, if you're going to cover anything in the early 1800s, um, any of the political affairs of Europe, it's probably tied to the Napoleonic Wars and the Congress of Vienna somehow. He also oversees creation of a holy alliance to ensure that no more revolutions threaten Europe's established order. The Russian Empire, after many great sacrifices in the wars against Napoleon, emerges more powerful than ever. But not ever. Yeah, this is true. So, you know, for a while now, Russia had been trying to integrate into uh, European politics. You have figures like Peter and Catherine the Great, who both brought Russia closer to Europe. Um, you know, tried to modernize it, Europeanize it. Um, and following the Congress of Vienna, Russia is truly one of the European great powers, and it holds a lot of influence in European geopolitics. Everyone in Russia is pleased with the new state of affairs. A group of young army officers dream of a different future for Russia. A new form of government, radical reforms, even a Russia without a Tsar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they specifically say young army officers um, I don't know if they'll get into this in the video, but that's important. Uh, and, you know, this is how it sort of ties in with the Napoleonic Wars, is that, you know, all these young army officers who are the young noble class of Russia, they've just been on a tour throughout Europe, basically, you know? Um, they've made their way to Paris to fight Napoleon. And while they're in Europe, particularly while they're in France... Um, you know, they get a bit of time off, uh, especially after they defeat Napoleon. Uh, and while, you know, they're there, they're exploring Paris, they're talking to people, they're picking up on some of the politics, they're reading some of the literature. And so they start to pick up some of these Western, modern, enlightened ideas. Um, and as I suspect we'll see in this video, they begin to bring many of them back to Russia. Uh, that's one of the ways that these ideas sort of get brought back to the Russian Empire. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. These days, more and more... Alright, so you guys know the deal. I won't necessarily watch through the whole ad placement, uh, but I will say, go check out Epic History TV's video. It's linked down below. They make fantastic content. Please go check it out. Give it a like. And go and check out their sponsor, um, which will be linked uh, in the description of their video. Uh, you know, go and give them some love. Show them some support. 
we always want to show support to the original content creators. Fastest VPN available. We have a brilliant deal for Epic History TV viewers. A 61% discount if you sign up using nordvpn.com slash epichistorytv. Wow, very nice. So there's their link on the screen. Go use that to support them. Or just click the link in the video description. Plus, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee for peace of mind. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. In 1812, Napoleon had invaded Russia with the largest army Europe had ever seen. It was a defining moment in his reign. But he underestimated Russian resolve. Mm. Four months later, the remnants of his army began its infamous retreat from Moscow. The Russian army and its coalition allies then drove Napoleon's forces back across Europe, fighting giant battles in Germany, and finally arriving in the streets of Paris itself. Napoleon's abdication was a moment of triumph for Emperor Alexander and for Russia. For many young Russian officers, it was also an eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. Imperial Russia was an autocracy, ruled by an emperor with no checks upon his power. Yeah, uh, it was one of, if not the most autocratic state in all of Europe. Now, you know, we think about governments at this time, and we think about, for example, the absolute monarchy, um, there were absolute monarchs throughout Europe, uh, monarchs who held a high degree of power. But even these absolute monarchs often had pretty hefty checks on their power. Um, usually the nobility of these European countries would provide a check on the power of the monarch. Um, and even the people would provide a check on the monarch's power. So oftentimes uh, the monarch had far more limited power than you would expect. Uh, in the case of Russia, the Russian Tsar, while he didn't, well, he or she, didn't have uh, unlimited power or absolute power, that's impossible practically, they had an extremely high level of control over uh, their people and their nobles. Um, you know, they probably had a higher level of individual control than any other monarch in Europe. There was no political opposition or constitution. There was no freedom of speech or right to trial. <coughs> Approximately 80% of Russians were serfs, peasants with no rights, freedom, or hope of betterment, their status passed down to their children. The inefficiency, not to mention injustice of such a system, was increasingly apparent even to many Russian aristocrats. Mm. In Europe, serving as officers in the Russian army, They'd visited countries where serfdom had been swept aside by war and revolution, and where monarchs had granted constitutions that limited their power, protected freedoms, and acknowledged the rule of law. Yeah, so at this time in the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, in many parts of Europe, serfdom was already gone, um, and in many other parts of Europe, it was on its way out. It was uh, in the process of being abolished, forced labor was being abolished, um, you know, during this time period. Um, in comparison to Russia, who kept serfdom until uh, the 1860s or 70s, I believe. So they will hold on to this coercive institution for decades longer. But uh, these, you know, Russian officers are going throughout Europe, um, and they may already not be super keen on serfdom. Uh, and they're seeing all these other countries where it's being abolished um, or limited. Um, and so, you know, when you sort of see these things across Europe, you might start see thinking some things about your own country. Many were inspired and began to dream of similar reforms in Russia. But few placed faith in Emperor Alexander to aid their cause. Hmm. Yeah, Alexander, as I'm sure we'll see throughout this video, was a very strong character. 
uh, and he was, you know, very much a the type of guy who wanted to do things his way. Uh, if he wanted something, he would get it. If he wanted something done in a particular way, it would get done that particular way. Um, he is not one to budge on what he wants because other people don't like it. On the night of the 11th of March, 1801, Alexander's father, Emperor Paul, was strangled to death by a group of disaffected army officers. Alexander succeeded to the throne, aged just 23. The ineffectiveness and chaos of his father's rule had appalled him. In 1797, he'd written to his tutor, to speak plainly, the well-being of the state is not at all considered in the administration of affairs. There is only absolute power, which does everything wrong and at cross purposes. The choice of officials is entirely a matter of favoritism. Merit counts for nothing. The farmer is plagued, commerce is hindered, personal liberty and well-being are reduced to nothing. There you have the picture of Russia. Judge how my heart must suffer. <laughs> the young Alexander displayed a great enthusiasm for reform, an encouraging sign to Russian aristocrats who wished to see a more modern Russian state. Yeah, and, you know, when you think about the succession, uh, this makes a bit of sense. You know, before Paul, we had Catherine, Catherine the Great, and she is obviously well known for her enlightened reforms. Um, you know, Catherine and Peter um, are known as modernizing uh, czars. Um, and she was to a certain extent. Frankly, you know, I, I kind of think her achievements are somewhat overblown um, because she still maintains the structures of absolute autocracy and she even went back on some of her enlightened reforms. But, you know, that's what she was known for. And then Paul comes after her and like they mentioned, he was basically a disaster. So Alexander is kind of looking to return to that golden age of uh, enlightened reforms in Russia, where things are getting better and Russia is moving up in the world. Or at least that's what he says. Um, you know, Alexander would say a lot of things, and we'll see how those, um, you know, how the things he says actually play out. In 1803, he passed a decree that gave landowners the right to free their serfs. Many hoped it was a first step towards the abolition of serfdom. In 1808, the brilliant and liberal-minded Mikhail Speransky became Alexander's chief advisor. He created a new council of state to advise the emperor, and even began working on a Russian constitution. Yep. But in 1812, Alexander's appetite for reform ended abruptly. First, an anti-reform faction, led by the Emperor's sister, Grand Duchess Ekaterina Pavlovna, engineered Speransky's dismissal. Then, Napoleon invaded Russia. In this moment of supreme crisis, Alexander was seized by religious fervor. A... And ju just a note on Speransky, they talked about how um, you know, a, a faction, an anti-reformist faction, engineered his removal. In addition, um, you know, they said Speransky was trying to develop a constitution, a code of law. Um, he was obviously very much influenced by European Enlightenment ideals, um, particularly French Enlightenment ideals. Um, I mean, you know, the Enlightenment was very much centered in France. Um, and that was becoming quite unpopular in Russia. Um, given the heating tension with France um, and, you know, Napoleon's about to invade. So that was another reason why Speransky sort of fell from power, was that he was seen as too French, you know? Um, even if we do want reforms of the government, we don't want these French reforms. Um, so that was another, uh, you know, reason for Speransky's downfall. Sense of personal mission and national destiny. The burning of Moscow, he declared, had illuminated his soul. Liberal reforms, he could now see, were only the road to anarchy and chaos. They were an intolerable risk to Russia's holy institutions. In 1815, any officers returning from Europe harboring hopes of reform were to be severely disappointed. Mm. Alexander added insult to injury 
by granting a liberal constitution, not to Russia, but to his new kingdom, Poland. Not one, it turned out, he planned to honor. Yes, so this was sort of a big deal. So uh, in the Congress of Vienna, um, it, uh, one of the big questions was the question of Poland, because Poland, um, before the Congress, had first been absorbed by its neighbors, Austria, Russia, and Prussia. They had completely absorbed the territory of Poland, and it ceased to exist. Then Napoleon would found the Duchy of Warsaw, um, where Poland once was, using part of the Polish territory, not the entire country. And so going into the Congress, there was sort of the question of, well, what do we do with Poland? Um, you know, some, uh, particularly Prussia, Russia, and Austria, wanted to either not have Poland at all so they could keep their territory, or bring it back in some limited way. Um, some more liberal figures wanted to re recreate an independent Polish nation. What happened was that the, the Kingdom of Poland, or as it's known, Congress Poland, was created, um, <coughs> and Alexander was made uh, the head of state of this country, um, and per the Congress, it was granted a liberal constitution. Now, on one hand, this liberal constitution um, would give initially hope to some Russian liberals, because they saw this as a sign that Alexander may grant Russia a liberal constitution one day. Uh, but then quickly, this hope turned to disillusionment when Alexander would basically rule Poland like an absolute monarch. He would ignore the constitution, he would ignore the political institutions of uh, Congress Poland, uh, and eventually Poland would just be reabsorbed into the Russian Empire. Um, so, th you know, this was a really uh, interesting course of events where, you know, like earlier in Alexander's reign, we see some flirtation with liberal ideals. We see him sort of uh, talking the talk, um, you know, speaking positively of enlightened liberal ideals. But then when it really comes down to it, he doesn't follow through. He, you know, behaves like an autocrat, you know, which he is. Three years later, when Alexander raised the possibility of a Russian constitution based on this Polish experiment, it proved an empty promise. Right. Idealistic young officers, more alienated than ever, decided that if the emperor would not take up their cause, they must act themselves. They began to organize secret societies and to plan a revolution. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of these secret societies, these Russian secret societies, had ties to secret societies in Poland. Um, because Poland had a lot of uh, <laughs> liberal discontent, um, which makes sense because their country had been absorbed, and now, you know, they were basically not getting an independent nation back. So there was a lot of secret societies um, and liberal discontent in Poland, and so they were already sort of... Uh, you know, organizing and talking about these ideas. Um, and so, you know, they had ties to a lot of these Russian groups because they had some similar ideas. They both held these liberal enlightened viewpoints, though, of course, these Polish liberals were always more focused on Polish independence, um, which the Russian liberals were not focused on. <laughs> Mm. And that's a quote from Ryleyev. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that, but I'm sure we'll hear more about him because he was one of the most prominent Decemberists. Many Russian military officers already belonged to a secret society. Freemasonry had been imported from Europe in the 18th century and was popular mm. among army officers. Yep. But in 1816, officers from Russia's prestigious Guards Regiments, based in St. Petersburg, formed a new secret society, the Union of Salvation. Four of its founding members would play a leading role in a revolutionary movement that became known as the Decemberists. Nikita Muravyov 
a captain in the Guards Division staff, aged 31 at the time of the Decembrists' revolt. He would draft one of their major plans for constitutional reform. Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Muravyov Apostol, aged 30 at the time of the revolt. He would lead the Decembrist uprising in Ukraine. Colonel Prince Sergei Trubitskoy, aged 36 at the time of the revolt. A war hero from one of Russia's most distinguished families, Trubitskoy would be chosen to lead the Decembrist coup in St. Petersburg. And Colonel Pavel Pestel of the Vyatka Infantry Regiment, aged 33 at the time of the revolt. Also a decorated war hero, badly wounded at Borodino. He was a brilliant, if uncompromising, officer and one of the most active and radical members of the Union. He would argue for the Emperor's death and creation of a Russian Republic. Yeah, he was one of the most radical figures of the movement and one of the more prominent uh, thinkers and writers of the movement. He was definitely an ideas guy. The Union of Salvation soon merged with another secret society, the Order of Russian Knights, to form the Union of Prosperity with more than 200 members. Its charter, known as the Green Book. Yeah, and so there were a lot of these different secret societies, but if you notice, they said, um, you know, more than 200 members. We're not talking about, like, a ton of people here. You know, these secret societies, we're not talking about individual groups of thousands of people. A lot of these societies were hundreds, if not less, um, so, and, and it makes sense because as we talked about, 80% of Russia is peasants, um, and they don't really have the means to get involved in any of this activity. Uh, in addition, Russia does not have a sizable middle class at this point. It's slowly building one, but, you know, as we've seen, for example, in the French Revolution, um, the middle class is often the class that pushes hardest for reform and revolution. Well, Russia doesn't have that. And so it's relying on its relatively small uh, class of liberal aristocrats to, you know, push these radical ideas. And so just keep in mind that we're not talking about a lot of people uh, in terms of the whole Russian population. It's a very small percentage. Book set out how the Union was to be organized. It also spelled out its commitment to educating the public about Enlightenment ideals of virtuous, mm. moral citizenship. This, it was hoped, would generate wider support for reform among Russia's elite. Only a trusted inner circle was privy to the Union's more radical, long-term goals of securing a constitution and ending serfdom. The leaders of the Union of Prosperity were wise to be wary. Alexander had tightened censorship laws, while allies kept him informed about Russia's supposedly secret societies. For the moment, he tolerated them, telling one courtier, You who have served me since the beginning of my reign know that I have shared and encouraged all these dreams and delusions. It is not for me to be strict. His new closest advisor, General Alexei Arakchev, felt no such restraint. Arakchev had masterminded the organization of Russian artillery during the Napoleonic Wars and was famed for ruthless efficiency, a violent temper, and absolute loyalty to the emperor. He loathed almost anything to do with Western Europe. You don't get things done by talking softly in French, he once so, and, and there's some of that, uh, I mentioned earlier how Speransky was seen as too French. There's some of that anti-French sentiment you're seeing here. Um, and, and this actually highlights a big trend in Russian history, which is uh, the idea or the debate over whether Russia should become more Western. Uh, this debate has already been going on for a while. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, figures like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great 
or instrumental in bringing Russia further towards the West, towards Europe. Um, but, you know, at this point, and this will particularly develop throughout the 1800s, there are, you know, a growing number of people, um, you know, particularly conservative Russians who believe that, you know, Russia shouldn't go closer to Europe. It shouldn't, um, you know, modernize. It shouldn't become like France or Britain. You know, it should be Russian. Uh, it should live on its own principles, do things its own way, rely on its own traditions. Um, and so this is uh, sort of an emerging debate in Russia uh, and highlights a much more general trend. It's remarked. Arakcheyev was put in charge of the emperor's latest idea, the so-called military settlements. The plan was to cut the cost of Russia's huge army by having soldiers and serfs live side by side in new villages organized like military camps with strict discipline. It was a harsh policy, even by the standards of Russian autocracy, and led to misery, riots, and rising resentment against the regime. Arakcheyev also enforced strict new standards of discipline and conduct in the army. The soldiers who had defeated Napoleon were now subjected to endless parades and inspections. Small infractions were brutally punished. Officers who spoke out on behalf of their men were dismissed. In 1820, a protest by the Semyonovsky Lifeguard Regiment, one of the army's senior units, led to even more savage punishments. To the Decembrist leaders, it proved that even elite regiments had fallen out of love with the regime. They themselves would be acting in a strong Russian tradition of palace coups led by army officers to secure dynastic and political change. The crucial task was to be ready when the moment came. Yeah, and so, you know, that's worth keeping in mind that this is not, like I mentioned earlier, some kind of popular uprising. This is an elite palace coup. You know, these are, these men are nobles. They're, uh, officers. They're some of the top figures in the military. Uh, this is an elite faction trying to take down uh, the Tsar, you know, another uh, elite. Um, so, and you know, it, it makes sense when, like I said earlier, you have 80% uh, of the population that are peasants and many of whom are serfs. Uh, they don't really have much time at this point for bringing down the Tsar nor would they necessarily want to with, uh, you know, how deeply ingrained uh, conservative autocratic ideas are in Russian culture at this point. By 1821, the number of new members joining the Union of Prosperity made its founders suspicious of infiltration and discovery. So they dissolved the Union. Its most trusted and committed members formed two new groups, each with around 20 to 30 members. The Northern Society was based in the Russian capital, St. Petersburg, and was initially the more moderate organization. The more radical Southern Society was based in Tolchin, Ukraine, where several Decembrist officers were stationed with their regiments. Both societies spent their time holding secret meetings at the apartments of their members. They would stay up late into the night discussing political ideas, reading aloud from banned literature, drafting manifestos and resolutions. The Northern Society adopted a draft constitution by Nikita Muravyov as its aims. His moderate document would make Russia a constitutional monarchy, but was otherwise heavily influenced by the US Constitution of 1787. He too called for a division of power between executive, legislature and judiciary, with each imposing checks and balances on the others. The executive was the emperor, supreme official of the Russian government, who would command the armed forces, 
lead foreign policy, and had the power to veto legislation. The legislature, a people's vietje, or assembly, composed of a supreme Duma, or Senate, and a House of Representatives. Serfdom would be abolished, and there would be equality before the law. The right to vote would be restricted to those who owned a certain amount of property, thus excluding the very poorest Russians. The Russian Empire was also to become a federal state of 15 regions. I, I think this sort of gives us an interesting look at the ideology of these individuals in that the Decembrists were a bit of a sort of mishmash group of different types of liberals. So there was not a uniform ideology except for general liberalism. But you had more moderate figures um, and then more radical figures. So the most radical of the bunch uh, would have advocated for the founding of a republic, which was still a very radical idea at the time. Some of the more moderate liberals, um, though still, you know, strong... Yeah, there's still strong liberal ideas, but the more moderate of the bunch would have supported um, something along those lines. So they're, what they really want is a constitution, separation of powers, equality under the law. They're not necessarily looking to get rid of the position of czar. They just want to institutionalize it, make it into the executive. Uh, they're not necessarily looking to uh, allow every Russian to vote only those who own a certain amount of property. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, the more moderate strain, but probably the more popular set of ideas. Um, those who would support the creation of a full-on republic um, were likely, you know, less common than others. Each with their own executives and assemblies. However, in 1823, a new member would take the Northern Society in a much more radical direction. 27-year-old mm. Kondraty Reliev was another war veteran and a famous poet. He was passionate, eloquent, and devoted to the cause of revolution. He was known for his satire of the hated General Arakchev, secretly circulating amongst Russian liberals. All fear, tyrant, for evil and treachery Thou shalt be condemned by thy posterity. Reliev despised monarchy in all its forms. There are no good governments in the world, except in America, he declared. He proved a highly influential figure, and soon a radical wing of the Northern Society formed around him, taking up his argument for a republican revolution. A friend described a meeting at his apartment around this time. There must have been more than a dozen people in the room, but at first I could not distinguish anything because of the dense blue haze of pipe and cigar smoke. They were sprawling on sofas and on the deep window sills. Young Alexander Odoyevsky and Bestuzhev sat cross-legged, Turkish fashion, on a Persian carpet. An intense youth with a pale complexion and prominent forehead lifts a glass. Death to the Tsar! The toast is received with emotion. Reliev's jet black eyes light up with an inner flame. They sing to the death of the Tsar. The rhythmic chant flows through the open windows for all to hear. Right, and as they mentioned, this is very radical, you know? We've just had the French Revolution. Um, which, you know, also became a very radical revolution. They uh, murdered their king, of course, but, you know, even the French Revolution, it took them a couple years to move from, you know, more moderate liberalism, constitutional monarchy, to full-on republicanism and executing the Tsar. And so you can see that even at this point, you know, we're in the early 1800s, this republican ideology is extremely radical um and you know i mean like he mentioned the only government that he would approve of would be the american government a republican government because you're not going to find uh many other republican governments throughout the world um i'm not going to say none because perhaps 
I could be missing one, but in terms of Europe, uh, you know, you're not going to find any uh, sort of Republican government. Switzerland may be the exception, but even a more liberal country like Britain uh, is not fully Republican at this point. Voting rights are still quite limited, um, and so this is very radical. The leading figure of the Southern Society, based in Ukraine, was Colonel Pavel Pestel. He provided the group with its own constitution, Ruskaya Pravda, Russian Truth. This lengthy, unfinished treatise was much more radical than Muravyov's constitution. Mm. There was no place for an emperor in Pestel's new Russia. The former supreme power has already sufficiently proved its hostile feelings towards the Russian people. The current order will cease to exist. Pestel called for a revolution spearheaded by a provisional supreme council that would implement gradual but sweeping change. The two main needs for Russia are clear. A complete reorganization of the state order and structure, and the publication of a completely new code of laws while preserving everything that is useful and destroying everything that is harmful. And I think that shows something interesting in that, you know, this is a more radical figure of the movement. But when you look at his goals, they're still liberal goals. He's still focused on reconstituting the government, establishing a constitution, organizing uh, the government and country better. Um, so, you know, the, these are still liberal ideas. Um, we're still not focusing too much on the social question. Stuff like, uh, like economic inequality, for example. Now, they're anti-serfdom, but institutionally, right? So, you know, despite the radicalism, it's still liberal radicalism, um, and, of course, it makes sense given the time period. We're talking about the early 1800s, and so we're still in an era of liberal radicalism. Uh, and the revolutions we see of this era, 1848, um, you know, the Decembrist uprising, the French Revolution, these are liberal revolutions, largely. Serfdom would be abolished, land redistributed to the peasants, class privileges abolished, and the vote given to all Russian male citizens. And that's a, that's a step further. You know, vote to all Russian male citizens. Um, you know, that's very, very French Revolution. That's very radical. Um, the land redistribution is also quite radical and a little more out there than the other ideas. It doesn't necessarily fit in with the usual liberal orthodoxy. Um, and I think that could have something to do with Russia's massive population of peasants combined with uh, Russia's peasant history. Um, you know, that idea could have something to do with the unique position of Russia. The northern and southern societies remained in close contact, despite major differences of opinion between and within both societies. Hmm. There was still much that bound them, all desired the abolition of serfdom and conscription, the end of autocratic government, the establishment of new rights and freedoms for the Russian people. Yep. What's more, they felt themselves to be in step with a spirit of the age, as revolutions and conspiracies spread across Europe in the name of liberty. Mm -hmm. Such events reaffirmed their conviction that change in Russia must come from direct action. A coup d'etat. Yeah, and so this, of course, is also related to the Napoleonic Wars and the Congress of Vienna. So in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, we see uh, a lot of liberal uh, action, direct action, taken throughout Europe. We see a lot of secret societies forming because the, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, particularly uh, with France 
taking over so much territory has spread a lot of liberal ideas throughout Europe. Um, you know, and people have started to adopt them, um, and now people want to implement them. And then the Congress of Vienna, all of these uh, European great powers come together, and they establish the status quo, you know, the conservative status quo, and they want to keep it that way. Um, and, you know, that's why we have these secret societies, because, you know, they're underground. They are <coughs> definitely not sanctioned by these conservative governments throughout Europe who want to maintain their positions uh, and their royal power. And so we are basically just entering in to this era of liberal radicalism and liberal direct action. And we'll see that throughout, uh, you know, I'd say the early to mid, kind of into the late 1800s. I mean, the revolution of 1848 is a big event in this. Um, you know, we'll eventually see, um, you know, the reunification of Italy. We'll see a lot of events that occur because of uh, sort of all these events being set into motion. And the Decembrists are one part of that, I would say. Or revolution. <laughs> In 1825, Pavel Pestel learned that the following spring, Emperor Alexander and his entourage would travel to Ukraine to inspect troops of the Second Army. Pestel formed a plan to assassinate the Emperor and launch a coup to establish a Russian Republic. The date was set, the 12th of March, 1826. After urgent communications with the Northern Society, Relief's faction agreed to launch a simultaneous uprising in the capital, St. Petersburg. But in December, unexpected news threw all their plans into disarray. That winter, Emperor Alexander visited southern Russia, where it was hoped the climate would improve his wife's frail health. Instead, Alexander himself became seriously ill. He died at Taganrog, aged 47. Typhus was the most likely cause. Alexander's sudden death was a shock to all Russia. The Decembrists had agreed that the best time to force political change was at the succession of a new Tsar. Mm -hmm. Now was their moment. But no one was quite sure who the new Tsar was. Alexander had died without legitimate offspring. By the law of succession, he should have been succeeded by the eldest of his younger brothers, Grand Duke Constantine. But Constantine was terrified at the prospect of becoming emperor. I will be strangled, just as my father was strangled, he would say when the subject came up. So three years before his death, Alexander signed a secret document making his younger brother, Grand Duke Nicholas, his heir. But when Alexander suddenly died, the new order of succession was still secret, known only to a few members of the imperial family. All of Russia assumed Constantine was their new emperor. Yeah, it was a pretty awkward series of events where everyone was like, okay, the new emperor, Constantine. And then it turned out Constantine was in fact not the new emperor, Nicholas was. Patriarchs, politicians, and troops swore new oaths of loyalty. Even Grand Duke Nicholas swore an oath, judging it better to observe the usual customs until Alexander's secret document could be made public. Yep. But Constantine, based in Warsaw in his role as commander-in-chief of the Polish army, had no intention of taking the throne. Nicholas urged his brother to come to St. Petersburg and publicly renounce the throne to end the confusion. Constantine refused. I cannot accept your request to come to St. Petersburg and warn you that I shall move even further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. Meanwhile, the Decembrists in St. Petersburg were meeting daily. They had been caught off guard by Alexander's death, but the chaos of the Interregnum provides perfect cover for them. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, you would think that this would be the perfect time for the Decembrists to act, and act successfully. You know, you have the death of a czar, and now you have this sort of complicated succession that uh, people are beginning to get a little confused about. We thought Constantine was emperor, but uh, he's saying he's not, yet he won't come to St. Petersburg and renounce the position. This should be the perfect time for the Decembrists to act successfully and effectively. They recruit more officers to their cause, sound out the rank and file, work out who can be relied on and who cannot. Relief works without pause. All are fired with a wild enthusiasm. That December, rumors, confusion, and fake news swirl around the Russian capital. Grand Duke Nicholas knows he is not popular with the troops. They regard him as another martinet, overly fond of inspections and parades. Hmm. Now he is told that unknown army officers are actively conspiring against him. He decides to act first. In the early hours of the 14th of December, 1825, Nicholas declares himself Emperor of Russia. He will require an oath of loyalty that morning from all officials and troops in St. Yep. Petersburg. The Decembrists know that if the troops swear that oath, their cause is lost. There might not be another opportunity like this in decades. The 14th of December becomes do or die for the revolutionaries. And before the day is out, the streets of the Russian capital will run with blood. All right. Uh, judging from that ending, uh, I presume we will get uh, another episode on the Decemberists since we ended right as the day of the uh, revolution is approaching. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens. I won't spoil it if anyone's unfamiliar, but in the position we've been left in, you know, the revolutionaries have been caught off guard to a certain extent, yet, you know, as I mentioned, this is also a very promising turn of events for them. They should be able to really take advantage of this and push their cause. But I guess we'll have to wait and see what actually happens. So, um, yeah, this was, a you know, as usual, a fantastic video from Epic History uh, TV. Um, apologies if the, the commentary was drifted a little bit today, but like I mentioned, I do know a bit about the Decembrists, so there was a lot going through my head while I was watching this one. I was trying to think of what to add and, you know, when to add it. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed this one. If you guys did, then I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon, which is linked down below, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and leave a like. I hope all you guys are doing well today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.